Hi everyone, this is a Disrupt Everything podcast series. Um, also, Disrupt Everything podcast series on video. We are uh, recording audio and then uh, also video for the new interview that we have this week. We have a new international guest, Sam talking in English. It means that today is interview time, is international guest time. You are in the Shop Everything podcast series. And today we are going to talk with Dennis Makana. We're going to interview Dennis Makana. Dennis, welcome and thank you for making the time. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. How do you feel today? Uh, honestly, <laughs> yes. I'm a little tired. Um, yeah, I'm a little tired. I haven't been sleeping well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that time of the afternoon when I tend to get low energy, but hopefully this conversation will lift me up. We light up the flame. <laughs> we light up the flame today. Right, right. So um, we going with the podcast and we going with the video, but first uh, we want to introduce you to Dennis Makana and all his world, world and work. But first, you want to listen our intro for Disrupt Everything podcast series, and then we going with the magic and we going with the action and we going with the disruption because today we have a great disruptor with us. Tune in and listen. Okay. Okay, we're here again. Welcome and thank you for being in Disrupt Everything podcast series. Today we have a Dennis Makana. Dennis is a professional and personal uh, interest based on interdisciplinary studies of ethnopharmacology and also natural hallucinogens. And he received his doctorate in 1984 from the University of British Columbia, where his research focused on ethnopharmacological um, investigations of ayahuasca and hukuhe to indigenous Amazonian psychedelic medicines. Dennis is researcher, ethnopharmacologic, and a pharmacologist, he's been on botanical medicines. And before jumping in his also ex really extensive and really descriptive biography, I want, to, I want to share with you that he worked with Shaman Pharmaceuticals as director of uh, ethnopharmacology from 1980 to 1983, and also relocated to Minnesota when he was working and joined the Aveda Corporation. He taught courses uh, in human affairs in, the, in different centers, also in Minnesota, founding member of Hefter Research Institute, uh, like a, is a non-profit organization in the fields of ethnobotany and, and botanical medicines. And he was a key organization and participant on the Huasca project, an international biomedical study of ayahuasca, use it as a sacrament by the U UDB, uh, Dennis is the younger brother of Terence McKenna, and uh, which is also a legendary figure in the in the world of uh, hallucinogens, psychedelics, um, philosophy, and and pretty powerful person. From 2000 to 2004 to 2008, he was the principal investigator on a project funded by the Stanley, Stanley Medical Research Institute to investigate Amazonian ethnomedicines for the treatment of schizophrenia and cognitive deficits. In 2017, with the collaboration of many colleagues, Dennis organized and present a landmark symposium, um, 50 years of research, which is the ethnopharmacologic search of psychoactive drugs, 50 years of research. The conference uh, has accumulated 50 years anniversary of the original conference held in San Francisco in 1967. In the spring of 2019, 
in collaboration with colleagues in Canada and the US, where he's based now, he incorporated a new nonprofit, the Makana Academy of Natural Philosophy, a mystical school for the 21st century. He now is in Canada and we want to welcome Dennis. We had like a rough cut. He kicked me out of the conversation. So I'm repeating some of your biography. Uh, thank you for the patient, patience and thank you for being in the podcast, Dennis. And the, the first question but uh, is first congratulate for the work you do and uh, being such an inspiration for many of many people that has started the, in the field of psychedelics and the psychoactive substances and the medicine work, the plant medicine work. And first, thank you for all your work and all, all the energy you've put in the, all these years. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. And the, and the first question, sir, now question, is if you were about to put your, your life in a timeline and uh, describe what were the most, uh, or the, or the most important milestones and what, the, what, what and why did you change and why they were important, what will be those milestones? Well, I think, okay, well, that's a tall order. You know, I've, I've lived, uh, I'll be 70 in December. Uh, so I've lived a long life and of course there have been milestones, uh, but I, certainly my discovery of psychedelics in the sixties, which was uh, more or less due to my brother who was four years older than me was maybe the first important milestone. We both got very interested in, in DMT at, at the same time. And, uh, uh, you know, back in the 60s, DMT was around, but it was very rare. But we encountered it. Uh, Terence was very good at working the matrix and we knew about it. And it just seemed very interesting to us. You know, uh, there were other, there were a few other psychedelics around, you know, LSD mostly, uh, you know, occasionally one ran across mescaline, there wasn't a whole lot of other things, but DMT was there and it just seemed quite interesting uh, to us because of its apparent ability to just put you in a completely different reality. And one of the uh, frustrations of DMT is it, it's quite short acting. It lasts about 20 minutes. And just by the time it just begins to get interesting, you're already on the way down. So in 1971, <laughs> we, uh, my brother and I went to uh, the Colombian Amazon in search of this, this uh, Witoto uh, hallucinogen called Ukuhe which I eventually ended up doing uh, part of my doctoral thesis on Ukuhe, but that was 10 years later. In 1971, we went there uh, looking for Ukuhe because we thought it was orally active. And that's the thing, DMT is not orally active by itself. It requires an MAO inhibitor like ayahuasca. We didn't know about ayahuasca at the time, or actually nobody knew that ayahuasca is really that. It's a combination of DMT and other plants that contain monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which prevent its breakdown in, in the gut and allow it to enter the, the brain in an active form, enter the, the bloodstream. So our rationale was we thought if we could find an orally active form, we could spend more time in, in that state, in that place, and might have a chance to learn more because as impressive as it is, the DMT experience is quite short and you can't really bring much back from it other than the sense that something really incredible has happened. But you know, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to integrate that. So we went there and uh, to La Chirera in the Colombian Amazon. And the reason we went to La Chirera 
is because that was the ancestral home of the Witoto people. And we had heard, we had stumbled across a paper by Richard Schulte, a famous ethnobotanist who probably the world's expert at the time on the ethnobotany of, of psychedelics describing this material. And we thought, well, we have to go get it, you know? And, and so that was our rationale for more or less stopping everything we were doing. I was in school at the time. Uh, my brother had, you know, was not really gainfully employed. So we decided to go down there and look for this thing. And uh, when we actually got to La Chirera, uh what we found where when we came to La Chirera, we found that there had been a pasture cleared around this village and uh, they brought cattle in there and uh, the white humpback cattle and uh, the uh, the dung of that cat of those cows happens to be the preferred substrate for psilocybe cubensis the pan tropical psilocybin mushroom mm. so that was everywhere and they were big <laughs> clusters of it going out of every cow pie and we were actually quite uh, cavalier about it at the time we we knew what it was we had had no experience with it but we'd done our homework we knew what it was and we sort of thought well you know we can have fun with these we can enjoy these while we're waiting to make the right connections to get the okuhe which we thought the okuhe was the real mystery you know and actually the mushrooms made it clear very quickly that they were the real mystery <laughs> <laughs> and we started consuming pretty large amounts on a pretty regular basis. And it downloaded a bunch of information to us. It had things that wanted us to pay attention to. And uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of that. You can read about all that in my brother's book, True Hallucinations, or my book, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. But suffice to say that we got off into some pretty strange territory in terms of this message that seemed to be coming either through the mushrooms or, or from the mushrooms, it wasn't clear. But anyway, you asked me to describe major milestones in my, mm -hmm. in my life, and that was a big one, was going to South America and looking for this thing. And, uh, you know, the and, and so we got through that. We wrote the book. We wrote a book that tried to put a scientific <laughs> basis on sort of what we've been told, what we, the information that we'd accessed called The Invisible Landscape. And we published that in 1975. And uh, about the same time, we published a little book, a handbook, actually, very small book called uh, Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide. And we had brought back spores from the Amazon and f worked for a couple of years to figure out how to grow these things. And then we, we did, and then we published this book. And although we had many interesting theories and ideas that came uh, out of our experiences at La Chirera, which we've written about in our respective books. But I think in terms of the most significant discovery that we came, that came out of that whole experience was the fact that we brought spores back and figured out how to grow them, a very simple method, then published this book. So that got this technique, this, this simple, you know, kitchen chemistry basically, technique for growing mushrooms. And I think that had a lot to do with the societal impact that, uh, that, it had, that, you know, psilocybin and psychedelics in general have had on society. So that was the seventies for us. That's, that's what we were doing. And then I did a master's degree during that period at uh, the University of Hawaii. And then I ended up going to 
the University of British Columbia for my PhD. And uh, I made my thesis, my doctoral thesis was focusing on ayahuasca primarily, and also this other drug that we had come back with called the ukuhe. It was kind of a chemical and uh, pharmacological comparison of those uh, two things. And then after that, I got my PhD in 1984, published some papers on my research and ended up being the world's most unemployable expert on psychedelics probably at the time. <laughs> You know, it it wasn't an era where a specialist, um, there wasn't a whole lot of demand for a specialist in psychedelics, although I had, you know, I had published and all that. But an opportunity came up to go to National Institute of Mental Health. I applied for a fellowship program at the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, originally to study ayahuasca or some of the compounds in ayahuasca. I ended up not doing that, but I was, I ended up working on another aspect of psychedelics in, in that two year period at NIMH. And then I continued that work at Stanford for another two years working, mostly uh, working in, in some parts on MDMA and uh, also on a, another compound called DOI, which was a very selective uh, uh, psychedelic, a synthetic psychedelic. So it's very, very selective for the 5-HT2A receptors. So the 5-HT2A, the serotonin 2A receptors are the targets for most psychedelics. And this was a, this was a molecular probe essentially because we can, it was an iodinated compound, so we could label it with radioactive iodine. And I was using it as a way to map the distribution of 5-HT2A receptors. That's what I was doing at NIMH and continued that work at Stanford. Uh, so essentially just a, a cortical mapping uh, project in rats, obviously, not in humans. Uh, but at the end of that, uh, um, two year uh, or four year actually postdoc, then I came, then Shaman Pharmaceuticals was getting started. So they invited me to join and, uh, and I did, and I welcomed the chance to sort of get, get back into natural products because I've taken a four year detail from that one excuse me, but I was not really working with plants. So I was, uh, I was happy to be able to join Shaman Pharmaceuticals. You can tell by the name, it's ethnobotany driven drug discovery, basically. And I had all these skills under my belt from two years in the neuroscience area. So I knew how to do all these uh, receptor binding assays for just about every kind of neurotransmitter known at the time. And uh, so I set up their screening program for, for applying this technology to uh, plant extracts. And they were interested in uh, analgesics mostly. But anyway, I, I set up that. I worked at Shaman for two or three years. I started in 1990. And, uh, worked to the end of 1992. And then I was getting a little disillusioned uh, with sort of their corporate stance on certain things. So uh, I gave that up and I got a job. I was offered a job with Aveda of all places with the, uh, to look for, uh, it's a cosmetics company and they wanted to get new ingredients from natural sources particularly in the rainforest. So they uh, uh, hired me to look into that. And during that period, well, they sent me to Brazil on an expedition to look for, you know, things that might be used in their formulations. But during that period, I also uh, organized a biomedical study of ayahuasca in 1993 um, with a, a uh, 
one of the syncretic churches in Brazil called the UDV, the Union de Vegetal. And we, I enlisted some colleagues. We were able to get some funding to carry out this study. And it turned out to be kind of a landmark study because nothing like that had been done before. And uh, we published out of that, the, the work was done in Manaus, Brazil in 1993. And then for the more or less for the, over the next few years, we published about eight or nine peer reviewed papers about that, excuse me, that grew out of that study. And, uh, and so that, that brought me to the end of the 90s and uh, 1999, I, we learned that my brother had uh, glioblastoma, which is a very virulent form of brain cancer. And uh, we learned that in 1999 and most people don't survive it. Um, it's 98% mortality <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, this was very worrisome, of course, for both of us. And uh, I'd been a consultant for some years in the dietary supplement industry. So I didn't really have a job that I had to go to or anything, or it was all freelance consulting work, you know. So I, uh, I was able to pretty much drop everything and be with my brother over the most of 1999. And then, you know, we tried everything to see if there was a treatment, but we didn't find anything. There was, you know, he got into an experimental uh, clinical trial and gene therapy trial that we hoped might work, but it didn't. So he died in, uh, in 2000, in April, 2000, less than a year after he'd been diagnosed. So that was, uh, and that was typical, you know, that was the typical course of this disease. So after that, uh, after he passed on, I really didn't know what to do. Uh, you know, I'd been a consultant, but all my consultant work had dried up, uh, which is what happens when you, you know, you're not constantly trying to get more work. So I really didn't know what to do. And then I got a chance to join the faculty of the uh, University of Minnesota um, and start teaching ethnobotany or as it turned out, ethnopharmacology. So that kept me going for a while. And, uh, you know, I did other things during that period too. I started traveling back in South America. And as you mentioned earlier, I got a grant from the Stanley Medical Research Institute uh, to look at Amazonian ethnomedicines um, as potential sources of, to treat uh, schizophrenia or cognitive deficits. And I, I got that grant, I carried that out from uh, 2004 to 2008 and we didn't find a new molecule to treat schizophrenia, but we found some very interesting plants that might point in that direction. We couldn't carry the work much further than that. Uh, but uh, for me, that period was a, uh, an opportunity to sort of reactivate all my connections in Peru that I'd had since 1981 when I first went there. Uh, all the folks that I'd worked with then, including a, you know, an amazing botanist by the name of Juan Ruiz, were still in Iquitos, still working at the university. So I was able to start working with them on this project. And uh, we did that and, and that really marked the point at which I started to go, go back to Peru on a regular basis. And, uh, um, and that continues, you know, or, or it did at least until COVID came along. I started doing retreats in, in the Sacred Valley around uh, 2012, brought a couple of uh, groups of pharmacy students down there uh, from uh, the Albany College of Pharmacy and, uh, you know, teaching courses on essentially pharmacy in the jungles. So that's more or less brought 
us up to date. I continued uh, teaching at the university until 2017. And then I left it behind just because I, I couldn't keep up with it and more interesting opportunities were coming on. So I moved to Canada in 2019 uh, and uh, my wife is Canadian. So that made it easy. And here we are. <laughs> and then I founded the McKenna Academy uh, of Natural Philosophy in 2019 after I got up here. So that's more or less brought us up to date. Uh, I think this is the most descriptive answer to that question I ever had in my podcast. So thank <laughs> you for that. Any, every milestone uh, which you recall, which, is, which gave us an open the opportunity to explore more every, every question. And my, my question that draws here is, uh, you say that uh, Terence was really good on metrics. So what metrics do you have into account for psychedelics? So what, metric, what metrics can we just follow to know if we are doing a good job or not? I, 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 I said Terence was very good at... Metrics. Metrics? Yes. No, I, I didn't mean that. He was good uh, at the matrix. He was good at... Ah, uh, okay. Okay, okay. My I, what I meant was that DMT back in the late 60s was very rare. It was hard to find. It was around, but it was very hard to find. But he worked the matrix. He ah, okay. pulled it okay. out of the okay. matrix. <laughs> and, okay, gotcha. And then, you know, gotcha. Yeah, and, yeah. And that, anyway, that anyway, but, but that, that question nowadays, uh, how, how, how can therapists and uh, healers can, can track safely the, their work to know that if we are doing a good work or just, or just we, are, or we are just doing a journey for the sake of doing a journey. Just, just doing, doing what? I'm, I'm... Sorry, I, I was saying that uh, like every, for example, therapist, how can therapists and healers track their work they're doing with the plant medicine to know they, do, they are not doing just a journey. They are doing work that changed people. Right, right. Well, I think you know, you're seeing this now. There's a, there's a renaissance in psychedelics. Yes. They're, becoming, they're becoming respectable uh, almost. And uh, uh, potentially they do have the, you know, the, the, they have the potential to revolutionize healthcare, mental healthcare at least. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that what psychotherapists have to understand or clinicians have to understand is they should look to the traditional paradigms. They should look at the ways that these substances have always been used in traditional society context of shamanism and ceremonialism and so on because the one thing about psychedelics there are many things about them but one essential element of psychedelics is this concept of set and setting you have to have the proper setting to do it and you have to have the proper set and the set is basically your mindset you know what you bring to it and it requires some preparation in order to get the most out of the experiences. These things should not be approached uh, casually. You know, they're, they're serious. I mean, they can be, they can be approached as uh, recreational substances, but at the higher doses, uh, they're not recreational. They can be quite challenging, but they can also be very beneficial. So the way that you, organize the variables of, I mean, you're basically four variables in, in uh, you know, structuring a therapeutic psychedelic session. One is the setting. It has to be an appropriate setting, you know, and usually if you can do it in nature or some situation like that, that's good, but it depends. The other is the set and the set is 
what you bring to it, really, your expectations, your experience, your preparation, what you hope to get from doing the experience. If whether it's a whether you're doing it, you know, there are all sorts of reasons you might do it. It you might maybe you're just curious, maybe you just want to experience an altered state of consciousness. There's nothing wrong with that. It does not have to have a uh, therapeutic rationale. You, uh, you don't have to be sick or have a disorder to benefit from a psychedelic. I mean, they are learning tools for everybody, but you, you, it does help if you have some preparation in terms of your set. At least you educate yourself about it. You come to it from an informed place. And then the other two variables in this in this mix are, you know, what is the medicine? Because there is a range of medicines that could be used, and what is the dosage? And those those are the four variables that define the uh, the therapeutic environment. And uh, you know what I think is, I'm I'm pleased that the uh, therapeutic. Uh, applications of psychedelics are being recognized, but I don't think they fit into a conventional biomedical uh, context. The the uh, you know we need to achieve a fusion between the ceremonial approach, the traditional approach, and the clinical approach. Bring these two things together, and then you can come up with a very powerful. Uh, um, essentially a set of protocols and practices for using psychedelics effectively. Uh, and Dennis, what, what can you extract from your, from your experience with, uh, in Amazonas the first time with your brother? What will be the, the most powerful uh, learning or takeaway that you extract from there? From my experience with my brother from the first time you were in amazonas with your brother uh yeah. what what can you extract what your biggest takeaway from from that part from that milestone <laughs> well it's hard to say without going into a very long story which i uh you know which i don't want to do or we'd never get out of here and people can people can read about it but I think if I had to summarize it, I think, and, and in general, if I had to, to say, you know, in general, what is the biggest takeaway that I've learned from psychedelics over the years? You know, uh, ayahuasca has been my primary teacher, also mushrooms, but ayahuasca, just because I've been spending time in South America and so on, seems to be the main one. And the takeaway, that I come away with is, uh, you have to acknowledge how little you know. That's the thing. I think that I think that the psychedelics teach us the limitations of what we think we know, and I think they they reveal to us that the universe, that the world, is far more marvelous and interesting and unknown than we could possibly imagine. So it encourages, hopefully, it encourages humility in one thing, in the sense that, you know, there is no room for arrogance in a certain way because the psychedelics will, will remind you every time of how little we really think we really know. What we think we know is a very small slice of reality. It's a very small fraction of reality. And for a scientist, which I am basically, I'm a scientist or was a scientist with that mindset, I think it's good for scientists, scientists to remind themselves of the limitations of scientific knowledge. You know, uh, in other words, uh, it's a very powerful tool for asking questions of nature and getting answers back. But those nature, those answers are always incomplete. That's the nature of the enterprise. You know, you science, you, you know, science asks intelligent questions of nature, structured in a certain way, so that 
you know, you can test hypotheses, right? That's that's the formal process. You test the hypothesis and it either, you know, the data that you get, the results that you get back from asking questions of nature either support the hypothesis or not. Or usually the way it works is it, they show that, you know, maybe a particular uh, model that you construct about a phenomenon or something you're trying to understand is uh, is incomplete. All scientific models are incomplete. That, and so they're all provisional in a certain sense. You know, you may have a hypothesis about something. And as far as you can tell, based on the available data, it's valid. It appears to be valid. But, you know, tomorrow or next week or two years from now, you maybe more data that comes in that completely overturns your hypothesis, you know? And that's very exciting. That's that's where real discovery How is. Because you, know, huh? you have to think it through. You have to say, well, that was either it was partly valid or it was it was completely the wrong track. And that gives you the opportunity to re-look at something. And I think, uh, I think that psychedelics are very useful for that in that way. That's really a lot of what they do. They take you, you know, both on the therapeutic level and in terms of this scientific endeavor, the scientific uh, effort to ask questions of nature, psychedelics can take you out of your customary reference frame. I think that's where the real therapeutic effect comes, it, it lets you step outside of yourself temporarily. What, what, what is now called in neuroscience, the, the so-called default mode network. Have you heard of yeah. that? The default mode network. Well, psychedelics temporarily disable the default mode network. So they give you, you know, the default mode network is a kind of a, a, a bubble, a, a, in a way, a model of reality that you construct around yourself. And it is useful because it's like ordinary waking consciousness. And we need that model to just navigate in the world and be functional and so on. But it leaves a lot out. The, the default mode network is, uh, you know, in part it's made up, it, in part it's a filtering mechanism. You get information from the outside world through your sensory receptors. You, you combine that with associations and memories and, and all sorts of things. There's internal processing. And then you construct this model of reality, which, is, which I sometimes call the reality hallucination. You know, it's this model of reality. It's convenient. It is not reality. We, we, you know, it's a model that more or less is useful, but sometimes you get trapped in that, you know, and psychedelics let you step outside of that temporarily. So this is where the therapeutic effects come as well as the, the consciousness expanding effects because they give you a way to look at things in a fresh way, essentially, and that, you know, and you gain insights perhaps about your, uh, you know, your issues, whatever, maybe your mental health issues, your depression, your addiction, your, your trauma and so on. You can look at it in a different way and perhaps see the root causes of it. And then you can begin to, you know, integrate that and, and, uh, and, you know, correct it actually, affect a cure. Most of the usually if, uh, used psychopharmaceuticals that are used to treat like depression, for example, they don't really let you get at the root causes of things. They're, they're like band-aids. They just, they just take away the pain a little bit, you know, but they don't really resolve the issue, which is why you have to take them you know, for many, many years, usually perhaps the rest of your life. And the difference with psychedelics is two or three exposures under the right circumstances, the right set and setting can actually resolve these problems that may be chronic, that may be, you know, years in development. And a few properly structured 
psychedelic sessions can can basically you know it's worth many people say about ayahuasca you know four nights with ayahuasca is like 14 years of psychotherapy you know and i think many people find it that way um so that's that's the the power of uh psychedelics the, the you know for mental health purposes it lets you get out of these habitual ways of looking at things and one of the ways it does that you know the, this 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 uh, reality hallucination that we construct our, uh, for ourselves the reality that we live in is an impoverished reality in a certain way because it is it's characterized by what doesn't get in you know there there's uh, filtering mechanisms. It's actually called in neuroscience, it's called neural gating. And a lot of things don't make it past the neural gates because they're not relevant to our immediate survival. But sometimes it's good to let those gates down and let everything flow in. And that's what psychedelics can do. That's why it's also important to be very careful about your set and setting because you want to do you want to let that process happen in a setting uh, where, you know, there's no real threat to your safety. You know, a, a lot about a lot of what, you know, you have to be able to surrender to the psychedelic experience. And if you're anxious, if you're afraid that you're in danger, you won't be able to do that. So you have to be careful about how you structure this set and setting so you do feel comfortable uh, you know, surrendering, and then you can plunge really deep into the experience, knowing that, you know, you're going to be fine, you're going to come back, you're not going crazy, you're not dying, you know, although during the session, you may think you're doing both of those things, you know, but chances are you're not, you know, you're not dying, you're not going crazy, and you just have to you know, uh, be able to reassure yourself that, uh, that you're going to come through it. You know, psychedelics are analogous in some ways to a near death experience, you know, or, or more like a death rebirth experience. And that's one reason. That's a big reason that they are very, uh, uh, spiritually cathartic. They're, they're, uh, you know, they lead to, or they can trigger spiritual renewal in a sense, uh, like being reborn. And there's something, uh, you know, there's something very, very valuable in being able to look at yourself and the world with fresh eyes. And, and that's what psychedelics help you to do. And Dennis, um, what have you found after studying and, and working with eth ethnopharmacology and also natural hallucinogens for more than 50 years? What are your, you said that this is what you was learning, but what you found working and studying the, o over 50 years, if I recall well? Yeah, well, uh... <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, uh, a big, really, really big picture question. Uh, just, you know, like uh, maybe uh, summing up. Yeah. Well, the 50, the 50 year thing is, uh, you know, uh, this conference that I organized in 2017 was the 50 year anniversary of the first conference by the same name. And uh, that book the, it was sponsored by conference was a private conference it was sponsored by the national institute of mental health uh, but it was a closed conference and the only thing that came from it that the taxpayers ever benefited from was this book called the ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs and that book fell into my hands at the age of 18. Uh, you know, it was published, the conference was in 1967, the years was, the book was published a year later. Somehow or other, I got a hold of a copy of that book. 
And for me, it was, it was another pivotal moment because I realized that was a, you know, that there was actually science behind this thing, that ethnopharmacology was a real discipline, you know, with, uh, you know, and, and that was kind of my first inspiration to, uh, you know, to pursue a career in ethnopharmacology. And when they first put this conference on, they were supposed to have follow-up conferences every 10 years, but that never happened because the war on drugs came along and they just, they were actually embarrassed they'd ever done anything like this. But the book was influential to me. So 50 years later, I always wanted to do a follow-up conference because there's been a lot of work in this area. And uh, the opportunity to do so came along in 2017. And so that's the 50 years we put up, we organized this small conference in the UK, but we, you know, I was able to get some funding to bring a bunch of, you know, pretty high profile researchers in the field to come to this place in the UK. And we staged this conference and, uh, you know, it was anything but private. We actually uh, live streamed it on Facebook. So, you know, the lectures you know, were at times being watched by 75,000 people or more. So that was pretty interesting. You know, lots more people know what ethnopharmacology means. Uh, so I think I got off the... I, I strayed from the uh, what you wanted to ask me. <laughs> uh, uh, all, you know, what you found after studying and uh, uh, studying and working on uh, ethnopharmacology and and uh, hallucinogenic substances for over forty or fifty years or, or, or your career? What are, what are your biggest found f uh, f finding here? Well, I, uh, in terms of my research, you mean, or? In terms of your research and also your personal experience. Well, like I say, I, you know, like I said before, I think they are, uh, you know, these things, especially the natural medicines, the natural psychedelics are, are teachers, you know, and they, they're, you know, whether they're external, whether they're actually intelligent entities that teach us or whether there's tools that help us, uh, uh, you know, gain insight into our own uh, unconscious or um, and so on. I don't really know. And I really don't think it matters in a certain sense. I think that they are tools for kind of exploring the universe within, if you want to put it that way, uh, you know, uh, within and without. And there's an interesting thing, uh, property of psychedelics. They can, you know, they can be tools for inner exploration, the so-called psychonaut paradigm, but they can also be tools for outer exploration in the sense that in some ways, I think psychedelics can be lenses for looking at the external world. They're almost like scientific instruments, like microscopes or telescopes. You can look at natural phenomena from the standpoint of uh, an altered state on a psychedelic, and you can get insights <coughs> about it just by having that changed perspective. And then, um, so, what what are what are the most uh, you were you were talking about natural psychedelics? What are the most uh, natural and healthy hallucinogens or psychedelics that we can find? Uh, yeah, we can find uh, and reach nowadays. Well, I, I would have to say mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I mean, mushrooms are easily accessed now, you know, uh, because many people, you know, they're widely cultivated. Um, they're safe, uh, they're, they're non-toxic, uh, and they can be a very deep, you know, they can produce, you know, depending on dose, they can, they can induce an effect from anywhere from a very light recreational dose. But if you take more, you can go quite deep into the, this universe within, 
uh, they're very good for that. They're compatible with our metabolism. So there are no issues with toxicity, things like that. Uh, and, you know, they're widespread because so many, you know, they're both widespread in the natural environment. I mean, almost every environment has one or more psilocybin containing species. You know, there are about 200 species containing psilocybin that have been identified. And if you know where to look, you know, you can find them no matter where you look, where you live. And, uh, and then, you know, particular ones like Psilocybe cubensis are easy to cultivate. So in terms of a, a choice, I would say, uh, you know, mushrooms are the most accessible choice. Ayahuasca is a little different. Ayahuasca is more challenging in some ways, and, and also there, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it really should be experienced in a traditional context. Um, hi everyone, this is Israel Garcia again, in my son's world, but I will tell you why. And this is Denny, Dennis McCann again. We had to cut the interview, we had to stop for at least three weeks because it was a, problem that happened during the interview so we had to stop and now we are recovering the interview we are uh, re re recap with the interview we are almost on the uh, end of the year with Dennis from in in Canada and I'm here in the United States so I was asking Dennis well Dennis uh, welcome again thank you Good to be here. I'm, I'm glad that we got a chance to get back to this. Sorry for the previous interruption, but you know, it's all good. Here we are. And it's <laughs> almost the end of 2020, which, which I think we can't see end fast enough. I mean, this has been a hellish year for a lot of people. So I'm eager to get on to the next year. Yes, 2020, I think uh, today I was writing about it in my blog and I say 2020, probably it has been the most interesting year of our lives. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I was working actually on my own blog. I'm starting a blog for the Academy and, uh, you know, the first blog I wrote is, you know, 2020 marks the end of the world as we know it. You know, in a certain way, <laughs> it marks the end of the world as we know it. You know, I mean, the world goes on, but things will never be the same. You know, I mean, there is there is a new normal, maybe. I, I don't know. But it's certainly been a disruptive year on many fronts. And uh, I just think things are not going to be the same. You know, maybe they'll be better. <laughs> you know, but I think I think we're we're going to you know, there are some rough times ahead for us in the next few years. Ultimately, maybe this will lead to a rebalancing, uh, a new equilibrium, but uh things are shaky right now. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. So then what do you think uh, before going to the the old interview? Uh, you you open the door for an interesting question, at least for, to me. Is what, what do you think we're going in terms of you know human and consciousness evolution? Oh, you don't start out with the easy questions, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, well, you know, as as far as human consciousness and evolution is concerned i i'm pretty optimistic you know i i think that uh i think that the rough period that we're that we're facing now is uh you know as difficult as it, as it is to be living through it the interesting things happen in times of chaos and change you know, and, and it's a measure of our adaptability to that. I mean, that kind of thing drives evolution forward. So uh, on the on the uh, on that front, I'm pretty optimistic. 
you know, if you look back at the evolutionary history of life, the most interesting things happen, you know, during periods of chaos and, and, and major threats to planetary life. You know, we're, we're, we're not there yet, but we may be getting there. But if you look at some of these great extinction events in evolution, 250 million years ago, 65 million years ago, you know, uh, the points 90% or more of terrestrial life was destroyed. But it wasn't all destroyed. And, and following those events, there was a great flourishing and an increase of diversity and, and, and uh, an increase in diversity of life. And also it spread into different parts of the planet. But these are processes that work themselves out over you know, millions of years, tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years at, at some point. We just can't comprehend those kinds of time frames. You know, we just can't really get our heads around those kinds of time frames. But this is how, this is the time frame on which evolution works. You know, so I think that's a part of the, the problem that we face is we have to realize that, you know, our species has, has been on this planet, you know, as an intelligent technological species has been on this planet for a blink of an eye, literally. You know, if you look at the entire career of life on Earth, the entire history of life on Earth, and you try to compress that into a day, by comparison, then we have, you know, it's about five seconds to midnight, you know, mm -hmm. that we appeared on this planet and have made the changes that we have made. So it's important to recognize that. And, and you know, I mean, I have, I have great concern for, uh, you know, for the, for the future of humanity on the planet, I don't worry so much about the hu the future of life. You know, life is very tough. Sometimes I say, you know, Gaia is one tough bitch. You know, <laughs> and uh, she's not going away. <laughs> you know, she has tremendous resilience and and uh, ability to adapt. We, on the other hand, do not. You know, and if we're out of sync with with the rest of life, with the community of life, which, you know, that's my whole shtick is that we're out of harmony with nature. If we get too out of harmony with nature, you know, Gaia will find ways to uh, correct that imbalance. And if it means that one species has to depart, then that will happen. You know, because in that in that sense, you know, evolution is not that compassionate. You know, evolution is a very it responds to the situation of the moment. And you know, I mean, you don't have compassion for you know, if you're a dog, you don't have compassion that the fleas that are infected you might be thrown off. You know, and it's kind of that way with us. And the planets, you know, I mean, in terms of our importance to the future of life on the planet, it's it we're not so important. We're important in 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 a couple of different ways, but but overall, we're not that important. But we're important because we have created technologies. We manipulate technologies that potentially could wipe out all of life on the planet, you know? And so that's a major thing because, you know, or if not all of life, much of life, including human life. So that, that's a major thing. And are we up to the task? You know, I've, I always, my, my rap is, I always say, well, you know, we're, we're very clever in terms of the, technologies that we've created the technologies that we can manipulate but we're 
but we lack the wisdom to go along with that. So our cleverness is indisputed. Our wisdom is not so clear, <laughs> you know, that we are wise. And there's plenty of evidence to, to show that we're not wise. You know, we're not showing wisdom in the way we relate to uh, the rest of life on earth. And, and the whole enterprise of the evolution of consciousness, you know, but that said, I'm, I'm optimistic for the evolution of consciousness because if nothing else, this is a tremendous learning opportunity. I mean, we are learning a lot, you know, in this historical juncture. And, uh, and so that's, that's a good thing. It's true. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good test for humanity and consciousness. So jumping, uh, jumping to the question we, we, let the inter we, we left the interview that were, I was asking about the most natural and healthy hallucinogens that we can find and reach nowadays. You were discussing mushrooms. You were, you were giving us a splendid, uh, an explained and detailed explanation, sorry, about why. So would you add any other hallucinogens or you go with the mushrooms only? Who, what, can you remind me what we were talking about? Mushrooms in, in respect to... Yes, in their... the psilocybe cubensis, you were, uh, we were saying that they are most, the most approachable, the more the hallucinogens that are easy to use, that are accessible and under a proper good set and setting where the right fit for starting and also getting the benefits from, from this side. From the yeah, cycle. yeah, okay, yeah. I, I think that I think that psilocybin or mushrooms are are among the most accessible, and in some ways they're kind of the ideal clinical psychedelic. I mean, they're non toxic. They can be given to people who are not in the best state of health necessarily. People who are dying, they can still tolerate it very compatible with human biochemistry. Generally, the experiences are not threatening. The experiences are, you know, enjoyable or at least tolerable. And, uh, and at the same time, it's a kick-ass psychedelic. You can have very profound, very deep experiences with it in these supportive settings where you don't feel threatened. Other psychedelics are are also useful, but they are not as ideal for various reasons. You know, for example, LSD. I mean, LSD has many of the same properties, many of the same virtues, if you want to put it that way, as, as mushrooms. They're a little bit long, you know, they, they last 12 to 18 hours. Uh, for most people, that's too much. And if you're using them in a clinical setting, you know, then you can't, you know, you can't leave work at five o'clock and go over to the bar and have a drink, you know, you, you have to stick around. So the length of time is different. Uh, and, and things like uh, ayahuasca, uh, you know, and, and my whole, I mean, more than mushrooms, probably ayahuasca has been a stronger ally for me for for most of my life because I, you that's know, my, I did my... That's my, next, that's my next question. So what's, what's the story? With, what's your story with ayahuasca and what, the, and what can you say about it? Well, I think ayahuasca has also tremendous potential for, for healing, for therapy, but it's, it's a... It, it doesn't lend itself to a conventional clinical setting so much. It's better if it's used in a ceremonial setting. And that's that's fine. You know, I mean, the difference between a clinical setting and a ceremonial setting is not that important. The important is that both are safe settings to have these experiences and to benefit from them. But ayahuasca works much better if there's a clinic, if there's a ceremonial context. It doesn't have to be traditional necessarily. But I think ritual is very important with the psychedelic with a psychedelic like ayahuasca. And then on the you know on the physical side, it's it's non toxic. Uh, 
compared to mushrooms, but it can be physically challenging, you know, because of inducing uh, purging and that sort of thing, which is not a bad thing, you know, seen in the, in the, you know, in the traditional ceremonial context, purging and cleansing are understood to be part of the healing process. And I believe that they are, you know, I mean, our body is full of stuff that it needs to get rid of and our minds are full of stuff that we need to get rid of and this purging on the physical and the psychological level go together you know uh and ayahuasca is another one that uh you know i would like to see developed for for clinical use but it's going to be a longer road you know because for one thing, it's you can't really make a synthetic analog of ayahuasca. Uh, I mean, you can make psilocybin, and that's synthetic, and it has pretty much all the properties of mushrooms. The the other alkaloids and so on in mushrooms don't make that much difference. It's psilocybin, so you can trace it to this single molecule. But in ayahuasca, it's a combination of plants. You've got DMT and you've got the vine, the MAO inhibitors. So pharmacologically, it's more complex, you know, and you can't really, you can't mimic this with a synthetic analog. People have tried, you know, uh, I mean, there you can use the synthetic DMT and synthetic beta carbolines. You can get an orally active preparation of, uh, of what they call pharmawaska, uh, and it's effective, it works. But in my experience, in my limited experience with those analogs, they just, they don't pack the punch that the plant preparation packs. You know, the plant preparation, and I think the purging component of it is important to the therapeutic effect. You know, because purging is, is a kind of catharsis. You know, you, you're familiar with the word catharsis? Yes. Yes. So it's a strong spiritual experience that often leads to a sense of renewal and a feeling that, you know, of, of purification, which it yeah. is. It is purification. So ayahuasca, I think, has great potential but I think it has to be approached uh, therapeutically on a, in an entirely different way. I don't think it should be separated from its indigenous context. I think there are issues uh, now because it's so popular and everything, there are issues about sustainability of the resource. You know, there's a lot of pressure on ayahuasca. Uh, and the plants are being over harvested. So uh, it has its challenges, but that said, I, you know, I hope that they can be overcome. Luis, because Luis, I think, that. sorry, sorry, go on. Well, I, I think ayahuasca is another one of the candidates. And then other things like uh, iboga or ibogaine, they have their uses, but they are more problematic to use. You know, they're, you, they really demand a clinical setting. They're, they're used for uh, addiction primarily, and they can be very effective. Uh, but they, are, they also have, you know, they are not, well, I, I don't want to say, they are safely used but they have some cardiotoxicity and other issues. So they should really be used to, under close supervision. So if anything goes wrong on that level, then they can, it can be dealt with. Uh, but again, and Iboga is another one of these traditional plants, traditional medicines that is really under a lot of pressure. Essentially it's an endangered species due to over harvesting. So, uh, and, and ibogaine, the alkaloid, un unlike something like psilocybin, which can be easily synthesized, ibogaine is tough to synthesize, uh, at least from scratch. Uh, uh, it, it can be done, but it's tough to synthesize. 
And then another one that has potential, I think, and, and it kind of surprises me that it hasn't received more attention, but, uh, uh, but it probably should. And, and that is Wachuma, which is the San Pedro cactus, you know, uh, and, the uh, and that has a, that's the most ancient psychedelic in the new world. One of the most ancient, at least and its use goes back six to 8,000 years. So it's probably older knowledge of Wachuma is probably older than even knowledge of ayahuasca and Wachuma can be a very powerful psychedelic as well. Again, being mescaline, it's, you know, it's 12 to 18 hours. So, uh, but I, I'm surprised. I mean, I, I guess, I guess in South America, uh, you know, it, it has a very firmly established tradition and people do go down to South America to have Wachuma ceremonies. An interesting thing about Wachuma is there, there are really about three or four species of cactus involved here. They're not only one species. Many of them are, are you know, they're beautiful cacti and uh, many of them are sold to, you know, at your local nursery, if you know what to ask for, you can just buy these things, even though technically they should be restricted if you apply the same standard that we apply to ayahuasca, but they're, they're freely sold, you know, which is kind of interesting. And so it's a matter of, you know, anyone can access this. You go to your nursery, educate yourself a little bit about what to ask for, plenty of recipes on Arrowwood and elsewhere to how to prepare it. And you can, you can uh, do it. You can connect with Wachuma and Wachuma is, uh, Wachuma is another one of these ancient psychedelics that is now bring, being brought into the modern world. It's, it, it helps that it's, it's not threatened. It's not endangered. It's not over harvested as far as I know, it's quite abundant. And, uh, you know, maybe eventually it will be, it, it will be brought in. But the length of uh, uh, the mescaline experience is, is well, you know, it, most people, I think the ideal length of, of a therapeutic psychedelic experience is, you know, eight to 10 hours or less. You know, just just because by then, most people are ready for it to be over. You know, and and they've they've learned what they need to learn from that session. So if it goes on for another eight or ten hours, perhaps that's not a good thing. But every one of these things is slightly different, and and everyone has, you know, potentially different applications. You know, so. There's a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of research to understand how to use these things, even though they've been around for thousands of years. They've been part of our society for not as long, but maybe, you know, maybe 120 years. If you, if you mark that, if you, if you put a marker down, you could say, well, Arthur Hefter isolated mescaline from peyote in 1898, I think it was, or something. So that was a major development. And, and that, that kind of marks when psychedelics began to be investigated by science, you know. And, and for a long time, mescaline was what there was. You know, there weren't these other things. We didn't know about them. But mescaline, mescaline was the psychedelic of the of the time until LSD came along, uh, you know. And but but there were psychiatrists and clinicians and philosophers and uh, explorers working with mescaline since its discovery. So the early part of the 20th century, it's not like there were not psychedelics, you know. But mescaline was was pretty much what there was and 
not to be uh, dismissed, you know. Um, Dennis, so. I have um, Luis has some questions. I will keep because I know he's gonna have a lot of questions, and I'm gonna give him like at the end of the interview. He he want to ask some questions. I would yeah. love he to ask you sure. questions. Uh, okay. What's what's the what's your what was your how was your first psychedelic experience, and how was the last one? <laughs> what was my first how was my first one and how well, was the last one? and how was the last one um well i don't think i've had the last one <laughs> you know <laughs> but, i mean i i hope not uh my first one my first real psychedelic experience i back in the 60s in the early 60s i i took morning glory seeds uh around the time it came out that morning glory seeds contained lysergic acid derivatives and people were going to you know seed stores garden stores you could buy the seeds and take them it was a waste of time it didn't do anything it made me sick it was nothing my first real psychedelic experience was with lsd in 1967 and uh I was I was in Berkeley at the time. I'd come out there to visit my brother in Berkeley in 1967 with a friend from Colorado. We got some LSD on the street uh, just from some crazy hippie looking guy that was walking down the street. And he said, oh, yeah, man, this is great stuff, you know. So, yeah, definitely strong acid, man. And so, you know, and he showed us these pills which were obviously like an aspirin or something with a tiny blue dot in the center. And we said, oh, sure, okay, you know. So as it turned out, it was pretty darn good. And uh, we went up to Tilden Park, which is a place behind the Berkeley Hills, and spent the whole day up there. And, uh, and it was a wonderful trip. It was, a, it was a, a great trip. It was totally not what we had expected you know i had expected a big mystical experience and and visions and all that that's not what happened what happened was that we we underwent a kind of an evolutionary regression we were like apes you know my my friend and i i mean he's he was also a big you know big guy we we're both teenagers And uh, and it was like, you know, reverting to the jungle. I mean, we were literally swinging from trees and hooting like apes. And uh, it was a great feeling. <laughs> it was really good. Not at all what I expected. Yeah. And my last experience, uh, when was my last experience? My last experience, of course, with COVID and all this, a, a lot of this is... Uh, You know, I haven't been doing much since COVID. So I guess my last experience was uh, uh, December, uh, December 2019. Yeah, my, December 2019. I had just been at an ayahuasca retreat, which I which I organized in in the Sacred Valley. But I had a chance to. Uh, stay a couple more days and I, I went to a center to take Wachuma and uh, I, I had actually had almost no experience with Wachuma. I had had one experience like some years before that was clearly a bad experience because I had a bad shaman and uh, he was not he did not have my best interests at heart and it was kind of a, a difficult experience the second one was fine it was it was interesting but again it was very long and uh uh i i took it because i i felt like you know i, I needed to take it under the right circumstances and really put this thing on the map so i could say You know, so I could say that I've done it and I've done it in the right way. It was uh, it was interesting. It was uh, very stimulant-like, and uh, 
uh, which which most of them aren't, but given that mescaline has also got some kind of amphetaminic type stimulant effect, I wasn't I was expecting that. Uh, and the chief thing, you know, the 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 main thing that impressed me about it was how damn strong it was. You know, I mean, my, my, my colleagues said, well, you know, you've taken ayahuasca hundreds of times. This will be nothing for you. You know, I mean, this is this is this is this is light stuff compared to ayahuasca. No, you know, it's, it's not. <laughs> it, at least what I took. I mean, it was a it was a full on dose and it was it knocked me back on my heels. You know, it was quite quite strong and, and challenging at some points, but uh, I, I'm glad I did it. Uh, I think it's a very good medicine. I think it's a healing medicine. For me personally, I'd probably take three quarters or half what I took before. I had no idea how much to take. I was just, you know, following their instructions. And, uh, but it was, it was worthwhile. But again, I realized that, you know, my two, uh, uh, I guess, for me, it's mushrooms and ayahuasca. Those are my teachers. Those are my my allies, primarily. And then, of course, there's DMT, which is in a whole other category, uh, uh, you know, as you know. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it was DMT that got my brother and I uh, you know, obsessively interested in psychedelics in, in the first place. And I, I've taken DMT a number of times. I've, I've lost count. I've taken it plenty of times. I respect it very much. I think it's, I, but it's hard to, for me, it's not therapeutic. Maybe for some people it's therapeutic, but it's so short, you know, you don't have time to really integrate it by the time you start thinking about all that it's already over you know so wh what you come back with from dmt is just a sense of astonishment and something amazing happened but does it help you work out your neuroses or whatever maybe maybe it helps with depression and things like that but dmt and 5-methoxy dmt have also been you know really profound experiences in that sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, for therapy, I don't, I mean, I think, thing is with, uh, uh, you know, with something like LSD or mescaline, the, the, the challenge to therapy isn't last too long. With something like DMT or 5-methoxy, it doesn't last long enough. You know, so then you think you've got to look at ways to extend that. And of course, that's what ayahuasca is, you know, uh, by making it orally active, you extend the time range from 20 minutes to six or seven hours. And that's the right thing. But but then that said, you know, it's important to uh, remember that, uh, you know, uh, psilocin, psilocybin and psilocin, which is the active ingredient is kind of an orally active form of DMT. Psilocybin, psilocin, uh, chemically is very, very close to DMT. And at higher doses, I don't know if you've taken higher doses or if you've taken DMT, but you can get to that place, you know, uh, up around six or seven dried grams. You can, you can access places that are a lot like DMT at the peak so it's this tryptamine dimension you know and the tryptamine dimension is accessible through different molecules you know the the, the simple tryptamines like dmt and fibrothoxy or orally activated dmt or uh uh you know psilocybin is is also part of that and and it's like there are different portals in a way, different pharmacokinetic profiles in terms of how long they last and so on. But it kind of connects you with the same dimension. I don't know if that's the right way to think about it, but that's 
that's the impression one has, you know, that you're actually in a a place like a parallel world. That's that's especially uh, true of of taking DMT. You know, uh, I uh, uh, other people have said this too. I often, when I take DMT, I often have the impression that you know it's very chaotic. It's very circus like. It's and it's like there is this parallel world that's going on all the time, like this, 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 this psychedelic carnival in hyperspace or something like that. And you get to poke your head up through, it's like poking your head through a hole in this, in this space. <clears throat> and you're there and you're looking around and there are entities and there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. They're aware of you. They're often, you know, it's like they're very happy to see you. Where have you been? How come you don't come more often? You know, all of these things. And and you just, you get that impression that there's this ongoing amusement park in hyperspace almost that you get to visit for 20 minutes and then it fades away and then yeah, the, line, the portal yeah. closes, you know? <laughs> and you were saying... I was. I did an experiment. I I I I take psilocybe, no psilocybe for fifty. I, I do macro. Mac. I, I I went through fifty-two days of macro dosing of psilocybe, and I got like mm-hmm. a, at the end of. I was going to stop at the day thirty, but when I go went to the stop to day thirty, it was so interesting because the journey looked like more like what you were saying, like a DMT DMT integrated into reality. And then I had to go to 40 days. And when I got to 40 days, it was more interesting than even the, the, the day 30. So I had to stop in the day 50 because every t- the, the farther I went, the interesting it got because, you know, you could, ex- you could extend more the experience and melting down into reality. It was, mm-hmm. you know, like it was super, super thought provoking. And I was, and at the time was refreshing from inside, you know. Super, super interesting. What were you saying? How many grams were you taking? Right? It was two grams a day for 50. Well, two, one on, one off for, for 50. Two, two, two grams a day for 50 one, days. One, one day on, one day off. I will, I will send you the report. I, I did that. I followed the scientific method. Uh, once I did it in Spanish, and when I finished, I will send it to you the. Yeah, I will send it to you to the, the report in English because I... Well, I I'd like this, to see it because yeah. this is not micro dosing. You know no, that. Ma- macro, macro. Right. This is macro dosing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a low, it's a, it's a low dose, but it's definitely an effective dose, you know, as you, as you discovered. And if you do it every other day, I mean, it, it it accumulates. I expect it gets more and more uh, profound the longer you go. So when you when you've been doing this for thirty days or forty days, I'm surprised you could hit the floor with your hat. I mean, you must have been loaded quite a lot, quite strongly after a yeah. while. As uh, so that what I found interesting is the day you were so one day on one day off the day off was the day that you can you can integrate so what mm-hmm. i discovered is that the the, the, the capacity of navigation uh, got sharper so you navigate every day better well first 20 days were like a you know like a hell well not a hell it was a psilocybe hell you know but the right. from, from day 20 and on i saw that the the capacity of navigate through the experience was sharper, 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 sharper. So the day I didn't do it, the integration was like, was, you know, was like, I cannot explain in words, but it was like release of everything, super clear, super focused, super aligned, physically, emotionally, spiritually, like intellectually. And then the other day, the way you navigate experience was sharper than the other day. So it got accumulated, as you were saying, you know, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I will, anyway, I will send you that report when I have it. Uh, I would like to. I would like to see that. Did you feel like the more you did it, you became essentially uh, 
I don't know what the term is, more and more immersed in this alternate reality and less immersed in what we call ordinary reality, which might interfere with your ability to keep your act together, essentially. <laughs> did, did you find it was like that? I discovered that the, the once I start, so once I start rolling, every day is happening, and uh, my, my integration into real life was easier. So, you know, I was doing an emotional release and I say to myself, okay, in three hours, I have a meeting because it was during COVID and I, we were in quarantine. So I, I launched 49 workshops. So every day a workshop. So I was doing workshop while I was doing the macro dosing. So, mm -hmm. so what I saw is self-discipline is a key component. If you are self-disciplined and you don't get carried away, you have a like a really solid self-discipline. It helps you to in integrate and to ground yourself through the, through the experience. That's interesting. That's, that's interesting. You know? I saw the power yeah. of self-discipline while you were doing the navigation. And it was, you know, I like it hit me because self-discipline is so such a guide in my life. Well, anyway, mm -hmm. um, what 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 have been what have been your biggest takeaways as ethnopharmacologist? And if you can just give us a small description, because some people might might not know what is a ethno ethnopharmacologist. And what you be in a, your biggest takeaways? My biggest what takeaways? Takeaways as an ethnopharmacologist? Well, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess you're familiar with uh, the symposium that we did, the ESPD 50, right? And the book that came out of it and all that, the ethnopharmacologic yeah, search. Questions. Yeah, ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs. My takeaway is that there's still a lot of work to do. You know, it, it is not, it is an active discipline and there's plenty of, uh, there are novel discoveries waiting to be made in this field, including uh, psychedelics that nobody's ever heard of. You know, uh, we, we might, I mean, we may think that we, that we pretty well understand most of the, the traditions that use psychedelics. If you approach it from looking at it from the angle of, say, plant chemistry and knowing some of the molecular constituents of some of these plants, which may or may not be used, uh, you know, they may be utilized in traditions or they may not. But knowing something about the chemistry, you can you can we can find new psychedelics out there. You know, and do we need new psychedelics? Well, I don't know, but but these discoveries make a difference. You know, uh, because every time you, you know, the 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 diversity of the molecular diversity of the plant fungal kingdoms is enormous, and every time you find a new psychoactive substance, it may have some properties that you never suspected, you know, that and it may hit receptors that you never suspected. A good example here is, is salvia divinorum, you know, the, the, the Mexican mint and, and salvinorin A. Have you had any experience with that? No. Well, it's, yeah. it isn't a psychedelic. I can tell you that it's not a psychedelic in terms of, the way it interacts with receptors, it's actually a kappa opiate agonist. It interacts with kappa opiate, one of the one of the three types of opiate receptors. It produces an extremely bizarre altered state, very different than a psychedelic state. Uh, you know, uh, but but you know, I mean, just strange. And, and most people don't like it. For most people, one or two is plenty. But what's interesting about this molecule is it, it, you know, its chemical properties and its pharmacological properties. So looking at it as an ethnopharmacologist, it's the most selective kappa opiate agonist that's 
ever been found, whether whether synthetic or natural, this hits only the kappa opiate receptors. Most drugs don't do that. Most drugs are what pharmacologists call dirty drugs. You know, they hit a range of re re related receptors, like LSD, for example, will hit most of the serotonin receptors, even though it's the 5-HT2A receptor that is responsible for the psychedelic effects, but it'll hit a range of receptors. Salvador A only hits the kappa opiate receptors, and it hits it very hard in the sense that 50 micrograms of this compound is a threshold dose. So the potency is comparable to LSD. It's the most psychoactive natural substance ever found. It's very selective for the opiate receptors, these kappa receptors, and it contains no nitrogen, which again, from a chemical point of view, is unusual. Most psychotropics, most psychoactive substances are alkaloids, right? So they contain nitrogen, like LSD, psilocybin, a lot of the CNS active compounds, nicotine, cocaine, all of these things are alkaloids, right? Salvador A is not an alkaloid. It contains no nitrogen. So on the chemical level, uh, it's actually more similar to cannabinoids, which are also, they don't contain nitrogen. Uh, why is this important? Well, because a new structure, Salvador A is just an example of why ethyl pharmacology is, is important, because a new structure often targets a, a new or an unsuspected receptor and may have mechanisms that are unsuspected. And uh, so these things are, they can teach us a lot about, you know, the molecular basis of consciousness, basically. I think of these novel compounds as molecular probes for exploring different aspects of consciousness, you know, and, and the place that Salvador and A puts you in is different than anything else, you know? Uh, and it's not like LSD, it's not like psilocybin. It's its own thing, you know? And, and some people like it, most people don't care for it. It's dysphoric, you know? I mean, I mean, if, if psilocybin is euphoric, Salvador and A is dysphoric, but hey, some people like dysphoria, I don't know. It doesn't matter, there are things to be learned from it. Um, and then and I, I leave that to other. I'm I'm not a psychonaut. I I am I my. If by that you mean somebody that is willing to take every molecule that comes their way just to see what it does, you know. I mean, I'm past that. I'm too old for that shit. <laughs> you know, I stick with what I know because I've got lots to learn. But I admire people that are brave enough to bioassay these things. You have to, you have to temper the bravery with common sense. You know, you have yes. to be careful with these things, especially yes. these new ones. You know, you never know. But it's worth doing because, you know, you're mapping the the space. You're mapping the the call it the cartography of consciousness. Well, worth experimenting right it's worth experimenting and try and see and analyzing and see what happens um, yeah. and Dennis uh, let's talk about the McKenna McKenna Academy uh, mystery mystery school for the 21st century um, so what have been the biggest discoveries at the McKenna Academy and and what progress have you made since you started the academy well uh, we are we are making progress. Uh, uh, maybe you, you want know, to give a brief, maybe maybe you want to give a brief description about the McKenna Academy. Well, the McKenna Academy is a nonprofit that I founded uh, basically in 2019, and uh, it's I describe it as a modern mystery school. So. It's, uh, it's, it's academic. The idea is it's, a, it's an educational institution, uh, but it's like the, 
the mystery school at Eleusis, or it's in that spirit, you know, where uh, plant medicines, in a way, are part of the curriculum, and uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, you know, it's a forum for exploring natural philosophy for, uh, you know, and natural philosophy is what science used to be before it became quantitative and reductionist, you know, I mean, natural philosophy, science, as we understand it today, grew out of natural philosophy, but natural philosophy casts a wider net in a certain way and recognizes that, there are other legitimate ways of knowing that are not strictly scientific, not strictly quantitative or based on what can be measured. You know, so in the spirit of that, it, it's a, I want it to be a psychedelic university in the spirit of Eleusis, you know, the first psychedelic mystery school in 1500 years and a place where people can learn about themselves and their our place in the cosmos and how how it all fits together and originally you know covid has has changed our plans radically because when we started out we were intending to do conferences and retreats you know which i had been doing before we were that was going to be a big part of our activity was doing conferences and retreats in South America primarily, but other places as well. And then COVID came along and shut all that down. So we've had to pivot to the online space and we're trying to develop our online presence. And that's, that's the option that's available to us now. So we've done a couple of symposia online. We've done uh, various events in collaboration with other people. And if people visit the website, they can, they can see these events. They can actually access them and uh, uh, listen to their presentations of some of them anyway. So I'll just put the website here. Nice. And uh, when you go to the website, you can look at uh, you can look at events and uh, and also we're developing a resources page, a learning resources page. For example, all the ESPD 50 lectures are accessible uh, from the Academy website as well. So we want it. So, you know, in 2021, we, uh, you know, we, we've been sort of in an organizational state, but in 2021, we really want to get out there and start putting more stuff out. We did a symposium in April, which uh, was called a tribute to Terrence, a tribute to my brother who died 20 years ago, last April. And that was a series of mostly interviews with me and different old friends of Terence that knew him over the years. And that was, that was a very nice series of events. It went over about five weeks. It's open access, there was no charge. So people can go watch those things. Then in the fall, we did a, another symposium on symbiosis. And uh, we charged a little bit for that, charged modestly for that. But that was another like two day, symposium on symbiosis, which turned out to be a lot about uh, uh, sustainable agriculture and permaculture and that kind of stuff, just, just because of the people that were presenting. In the year to come, we have some other symposia uh, planned. And we also are undertaking a big project uh, in South America to it's I call it the uh, knowledge preservation and recovery project, uh, which has to do with uh, initially working with a, a botanist that uh, I've worked with for many years in Peru. This gentleman named Juan Ruiz, who's a remarkable man. He's got tremendous. He's the director of the herbarium at UNAP in Iquitos, which is the uni government university, uh, Universidad 
Nacional Amazonia Peruana in Iquitos. I've worked with Juan over 40 years, since ever since I came there as a graduate student. And I've been very impressed with his overall knowledge of the plants. He's a man with one foot in science and one foot in traditional medicine. And he understands both sides of this very well. He never writes anything down, you know? So he's the guy about which you can say, when a medicine man dies, it's as though a library has burned down. I'm trying to work to document Juan's knowledge before the library burns down, <laughs> you know? And, and so we're gonna, uh, approach that and that will turn into a two or three year project but initially it's going to be a big documentary it's going to be a documentary about Juan kind of focused on Juan but in the process of making this documentary we also are going to interview traditional healers in the area we're going to kind of take a snapshot if you that. will of what is the state of of shamanic healing post post ayahuasca tourism post covid what's the 20th first century status of all of these traditions are they endangered i mean they're certainly changing so we want to develop this documentary around that and uh and then use that as a basis for uh working on this herbarium, which is a, a wonderful resource, you know, an herbarium, right? It's a library of plant specimens, basically. We want to digitize all the specimens and put wow. those online with the, uh, with the collection data, the use data and so on, and then tie these collections into global databases about chemistry, pharmacology, et cetera, et cetera. And just make that an open access uh, resource for people, uh, you know, with an interest in the Amazonian medicines, basically. And, and uh, in, uh, I'm a great believer in the power of information. And if you, can, if you can link a plant to a piece of information, no matter what it is, you've invited, you've, you've increased the value of that plant, you know, at least in people's perception, maybe not in the plant's perception, but people's perception is, okay, well, this is used as a, a psychedelic or this is used as an insecticide or this is used to, you know, treat the uh, parasites or whatever that, uh, you know, uses indicate, you know, uses essentially indicate something that the plant might be good for from the human perspective and, and that's the idea of creating this it will uh, making this library online will uh create a rationale to preserve these plants preserve the habitats because they're disappearing you know and the knowledge is disappearing especially the traditional knowledge so this is a way to try to document this and and uh you know, slow that process down if not if not reverse it. So that's going to be a big project for the McKenna Academy in the coming year. Uh, we've got some great people working on it. We have some initial funding. We're going to have to get more funding, but I think the money will come. And uh, oh, and by the way, if you visit the website, there's also a donate button. Feel free to use it, but. Well, so that's what gonna, that's what I'm that's what I'm focused on right now. Yeah. To share. So it looks like you're not gonna be bored. It looks like a busy schedule, and we're gonna share no. the we're gonna share the the links in the show in the podcast show notes and also make a call to action and congratulations by the by the McKenna Academy and all the plants. We are greatly excited and we hope to go to one hour. when I met you uh, through Alexander. Thanos, um, it was pre-COVID, and I and I, I I remember clearly. I was going to San Francisco to join in the symposiums and then interview you, and then COVID happened, and we had right. to cancel everything. So I hope right. uh, I can join in a symposium or uh, in a retreat shortly. Right. All right. Well, 
let's keep in touch uh, and as this project develops. Well, I'll I'll keep you you know just just keep an eye on the web page or you can register and then we send out newsletters and stuff. You're probably already signed up, but this project is going to go forward. You know, COVID has been a kind of a setback, but we're going to recover. And hopefully by the end of 2021 or later in 2021, when the people get vaccinated and so on, we can do some, we can uh, return to the original idea of doing some retreats oh. in South America. And that was part of the plan from the beginning. So, so hopefully we can do that. And, uh, and that, those experiences are really rich, as you can imagine, for everybody yeah. involved. Yeah. I hope, I, I hope we can join soon. Dennis, I'm going to go with uh, rapid fire questions to end the interview. And then uh, Luis, I think, is having questions. So I hope uh, we can catch up with this. We, we will. So I'm going to go with the rapid fire questions. OK. So, oh, OK. Um, so, what's your, what's your formula for a good living today? What is what? What's your formula for a good living today? <laughs> My formula for good living. <laughs> well, I don't know. Don't don't live by formulas, I guess. I mean, live <laughs> in such a way that, you know, do what makes you happy. Be good to the people around you. Take care of your health. Don't take yourself too seriously. I guess that would be a main thing. It's important to keep a sense of humor. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, if life is a cosmic joke, we should not forget to laugh. So I guess I could say that. Um, Dennis, what's your, what's your more effective uh, contemplative technique? So do you use any conscious or contemplative technique? What's, if so, what's your, your most effective one? My effective meditative technique? Hmm. You mean? Yes. I, I, I don't really practice one. I suppose I should embar be embarrassed to say that. Uh, I, I uh, you know, other than, than taking psychedelics, <laughs> but I, I guess for me, the my meditation is I I get a chance to get into nature, and that's that makes me happy, you know. So I try to get into nature as often as I can, and and you know, not necessarily for long periods. Just uh, fortunately, there's a little trail close to where I live, I can walk down that trail every morning and before breakfast. And it's a very good way to start the day. I think it's important, you know, one thing we lack, especially in, in these times of COVID when we're all shut in and everything, it's hard to get into nature, but it's important to keep that connection. That really sets me up for the day and makes me feel good, you know, to, to go into, places like that so how is your how is your morning routine and do you have a night routine so how is your morning or night routine how is my morning morning routine and if you have any night routine so do you have it not really <laughs> no i i don't have regular rituals uh, like that, you know. I mean, I have routines at night, but I wouldn't call them rituals, you know. Uh, I just try and keep my mind open and, uh, you know, keep reading interesting things and just stay engaged, you know. And uh, I think it's important to keep a person's curiosity alive. This, this is... You know, I, I just, as you probably know, I turned 70 this month. This was, you know, I turned 70, and that was a major. On uh, the 17th, I had, was my 70th birthday. Well, happy birthday, Dennis. So that's a, that's a major threshold in some ways. But I guess the important, the lesson that I'm getting from that is that 
it's important to stay curious. I mean, curiosity has always been something, you know, I want to understand and there's so much left to understand, you know, and, and curiosity is really what is behind the, the scientific impulse as well, you know, and, and so it, it, curiosity and wonder, those two things are kind of at the central core of what the McKenna Academy is about because they're at the core of what I'm about and what the core of, uh, I believe that learning should be about. You know, you have to, you know, you, if you lose the capacity to experience wonder and surprise, you've lost something really, really valuable. So it, so I don't know so much that I, I mean, I don't, you know, I think one of the lessons I get from ayahuasca and these other things quite frequently is a reminder that remember that you don't know shit, you know, in a, in a certain way, remember, remind yourself how little you know, you know, and, and on the other side of that coin, what that means is there's a lot left to know. So I am, I am excited by that. I'm not depressed by it. I know I'm not going to leave this world knowing everything or even very much. That's okay. You can approach it in a spirit of, you don't have to understand everything. You just understand what you can. It's always going to be an in incomplete picture. That's the nature of human knowledge. That's no reason to stop trying to expand the sphere of what you think you understand. Dennis. Um, that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's really good answer for coming on for a morning routine. You get you give us like a big, big, uh, big chunk of wisdom here. So what's 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 the what's the book that has impacted you the most? What has impacted me the most? Yeah, the book, the book that has impacted you the most. Oh gosh. Uh, well, uh, you know, I've been impacted by different books in different ways. Uh, I think actually in terms of my, uh, uh, you know, choice of careers and all that was was the first book called the the ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs that book came into my on my radar at the age of 18 originally the first symposium and it made me realize that this is an actual discipline it was very exciting and it was a discipline that i more or less decided to to follow. So, I mean, there weren't many people in those days who would call themselves an ethnopharmacologist. I guess there aren't many even these days, but it's a real discipline. And uh, it had a lot to do with my, uh, you know, with my decision to go in the direction of, of science and, and that sort of thing. And then other books, I don't know if there was a single book, but I would say that uh, uh, yeah, there was a series of books. The, the works of, of Jung, of Carl Jung, uh, were pretty impactful. <clears throat> Back when I was reading that, I think he had the right understanding of uh, of the mind and, and consciousness and all that. So that was, those were impactful for me, uh, you know, and there have been others, but, you know, I, I mean, I, I can't say it's not a fair question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can't say this book out of all the books I've ever read. Yeah. Yeah. It, just, it doesn't it's work like that. Dennis, yeah. what's, your, what's your message for someone who has never taken hallucinogens? Uh, well, my message is that uh, put it on your map if possible. 
it's important to put it on your map if there's not any good reason not to. I mean, some people maybe shouldn't, you know, if they're, you know, have proclivities to schizophrenia and that sort of thing, they probably shouldn't take them. But if none of those things are issues, I think it is important to put at least one psychedelic experience on your personal map and hopefully more than that, but at least one, I think it's an essential part of human human experience. It's kind of like sex. You know, sex is a very special kind of experience. And if you never have it, you can't be a fully formed human being. You know, you need that experience in order to know what it is to be human. I would say the same thing about psychedelics. You know, oh, I, I like what I like what Rick, Rick Doblin said uh, in a in the movie. Uh, I think it was Neurons to Nirvana. I mean, he says lots of things, but but he said people don't take psych. You know, he said humans don't take psychedelics to have psychedelic experiences. They take psychedelics to have human experiences. And I think that's a very wise thing to say. And I just think that uh, it's important that people have at least one encounter with a psychedelic in their lifetime and, and hopefully more, but, but at least one, you know, it, 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 it's part of being a fully formed and conscious human being. Uh, and what would so you say, that, and what would you say to to those who take? What would be your advice to those who take regularly? Who, who, those who take it, who take it regularly? Yes. Well, uh, you know, I I think that they should take it, but they should approach it thoughtfully. You know, they should pay attention to set the setting. They should inform themselves before they do it. It should be re approached, you know, with respect. It, it shouldn't be taken casually. It's it's kind of a, I mean, it, it can be, but I think the first experience should be approached, you know, with a lot of forethought, pay attention to what the medicine is, what the dose is, and especially what the set and setting is. These are the, the main variables that impact on the experience. And, uh, uh, you know, people should take care in the way that they approach it, simply to maximize what they uh, might learn from it. You know, I mean, that, that's the thing. You have to approach it. If you take it without that, uh, you know, if, if you, if then, it, I mean, it may be fine, but you're you're not going to get the full depth of the experience unless you approach it thoughtfully. That would be what I would advise people to do, and from an informed place, you know. And, and again, like these some of these resources, like uh, Arrowhead.org, which you're probably familiar with. You know, uh, I, I like Arrowhead.org. Uh, it's a wonderful website. And you know it? You've heard of it? I've heard it. No, I haven't. haven't. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the best online resource on uh, drugs of all kinds. But, but you know, uh, most of which uh, we've never heard of and I don't care about, but has very good resources for all the psychedelics. So if you want to, if you plan to take ayahuasca, for example, and you never have taken it, Go to Arrowwood and look at the so-called Arrowwood Ayahuasca Vault on Arrowwood. You can get trip reports. You can look at scientific information. It's That's it's good. like a crash course, yeah. you know. And then from there, from the links there, you can branch out. But as a as a quick uh, uh, lesson in what to experience, what you expect to experience, uh, Arrowwood's very useful. You know, and, and a lot of times these these trip reports are are also useful because, you know, then you know what other people have encountered. You don't want to 
get fixated on that because your experience is going to be unique to you. But you can say, well, okay, other people have had these kinds of experiences, so I kind of have an idea what to expect. And that's valuable, you know, and, and that goes back to, you know, the fact that just educating yourself about these things is, is a good thing. Dennis, I'm gonna turn to to Luis. Okay. Uh, he want to ask you. Well, most of the the questions I had uh, written down were answered in the course of the conversation. Uh, but the only one that I will like to hear your position is uh, with the democratization of psychedelics and more resources to know them and get access to them. Uh, and most of the experience are either deeply introspective that you can get work through your traumas. And there's a lot of people that have mystical experiences. For example, all, most of my experiences have been very deeply related to my relationship with the divine powers and, you know, with God. So with the democratization of psych psychedelics, how do you see impacting ordained religion worldwide and, you know, kind of like lifting that veil of, uh, strict rules that everybody follows in religion you know in western world catholicism muslims and you know they, people knowing the fact that you don't have to go through church and you know kneel and do the prayers to connect with god and there's a bunch of other ways to connect how do you see society being impacted by it well i think that uh yeah, uh, I, I think that you can't, you know, I, th I think that most organized religions are set up to make sure that you don't have a mystical experience. Yeah. And that's the last thing they want to happen. Yeah. Because then it's like, well, if I can have a mystical experience by eating this mushroom, what do I need the priest for? What do I need this whole <laughs> religious edifice for? What do I need that for? I can directly connect with the divine. And uh, I think that, you know, psychedelic experiences were probably, you know, at, at the base of some of these religions, including, you know, Judeo-Christianity and all that back in the day, but no longer. I mean, these, these religions are set up, they, are, they don't address people's spiritual needs, I feel. And that's why, you know, there's such interest in psychedelics, because people feel that their religious institutions are not giving them what they want. And what they want is meaningful, personally meaningful experiences. If, if you want to call that a mystical experience, that's another way to describe it but they want really meaningful experiences uh, that they can take to their heart that's why psychedelics are uh you know i mean i mean uh isra you know macro dosed with two grams a day for 50 days and, and i don't want to say that's a bad thing i mean that worked for him that was fine but one of the things that's remarkable about psychedelics is you may only take it a few times in your life, you know, but you remember those experiences and, and they become really meaningful to you. Maybe some people like me and others, maybe we have thick skulls. Maybe we don't get the lesson. We have to keep taking these things. Yeah. But sometimes you can take it once. You can take it a few times and that those experiences stick with you and they have an impact they change you as a person usually in a better way they you know it's like uh uh you know it's like way davis is fond of saying he says our, our parents told us you know don't go out don't take these psychedelics you'll never be the same that's the point <laughs> right <laughs> you'll never be the same so, uh, so that's the thing. I think that's that's how you approach it, and and how often you do it, how many times, and all that is less important. It's what what you do with the experiences that you have, and I, I think that uh, you know, I, I think it's important again to put a structure around them. That whole idea of set and setting is important, but it can be as long as there's a structure, it can. It can exist in, 
you know, I mean, there can be wide variation. You know, it doesn't have to be a traditional ayahuasca ceremony or, a, you know, a clinical setting, or it can be, you know, all of these ritual approaches to it are valid. You know, like I sometimes say, you know, ayahuasca is a liquid. It's going to fill whatever vessel you put it into, you know. And so as long as there's a appropriate structure that is, number one, safe, you know, that's that's the key thing that you don't have to feel threatened. Uh, you don't have to feel like you're in any danger. So it's good to have people around you that you trust if, if you do take it you know, with other people, it's important to, uh, uh, you know, have create a ritual space where this experience can unfold. And, uh, and really that's all that's required. I mean, it can be, it can be traditional. It can be something that you, you know, you create for yourself. Maybe it's not traditional at all, or maybe it's a combination of traditional practices and whatever works for you personally. I mean, taking it may just be, well, you know, you, you set up the situation and you, and you take it in a, you know, in a way that basically you have to do it in a way where you can focus on the experience and you can surrender to it completely. So you, you, you have to take it in a, in a, in a place at a time where you don't have to worry about those things. You know, nobody's going to call you on the phone. Nobody's going to knock on the door. You just, you just experience it, you know, and, and often it's useful, especially with things like ayahuasca to do it in a group. Cause then you have that group dynamic going and the, the shaman or whoever, you know, is, is facilitating it can really kind of, uh, manipulate or, or control the dynamics so everybody has a good good outcome. That's that's kind of that's why I like to take ayahuasca in a ritual setting when I take it. I, I don't necessarily buy all of the traditional. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not an indigenous person. I, I and there's no reason to try. It's just that I like the context that they that they create. So I respect it, but I don't really practice it any more than I practice any other religion. I'm, you know, I, I, anyway, that's a long answer, but there you Thank go. Thank you so much. Thank you for the answer. Yeah. You, Thank you. Thank any, any uh, would you say that in the ayahuasca experience versus the DMT experience, would you say the mystical component that ayahuasca tends to bring its enhanced by the work of the shaman and the Icaros and all the environment they create. Because every time I compare me, my ayahuasca experiences versus DMT, DMT is like 100% alien and ayahuasca is a lot more mystical. I always tend to wonder if it's the work of the shaman and any type of energetic work with the prayers, the Icaros, etc. What's well, I think, yeah, I think the DMT experience, it's so fast, you know, you can't, there isn't really even time to impose a ritual structure mm -hmm. on it. I, I think the, 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 you know, one of the best things about ayahuasca is you, you know, you can spend a, more time in this place and uh, it's good to, you know, have a roadmap in a sense. I mean, to have that structure for this strange land, you're, you're traveling in you know yeah. it helps helps navigate it with dmt it doesn't matter i mean dmt you pop your head through all kinds of crazy shit that's going on you know it's amazing it's astonishing and then it's over <laughs> you know <laughs> so before you can even begin to wonder i mean you know before you can even begin to wonder if you're you know am i ever going to come back from this yeah the very fact that you can ask that question means you're already on the way back, you know? So, so it's quick. I mean, it, it's definitely worth, uh, worth putting the, those tryptamines on the map, but if you really want to, I, I think ayahuasca is a better, uh, better preparation to, if you really want a, an ally, something you can rely on, 
and spend more time there. I'd say ayahuasca or mushrooms are yeah. probably the top two in my estimation. Uh, and yeah. Dennis, two last questions is first. So who do you recommend me to interview next? Who do you recommend me to interview next? Uh, well, who have you interviewed? Wow. You know, Alexander just recommend me to you. A uh, bunch of people I interviewed already. But who do you have in mind? Well, I don't know. It depends on what kind of an... I don't know. It depends on what kind of an interview you want to do. Uh, uh, Not sure. Not sure. What kind of questions you want to ask? Uh, I'm open to everything. So if something well, pop up. let me think about it. Okay. Next, uh, last question is: What will be, what will be the message you will you will share with anyone listening or watching this video or listening this podcast? What will be your message? Well, I, I think when it comes to psychedelics, I think that, uh, you know, as we, as we kind of touched on, I think that, I think that faith, you know, all religions say, or the organized religions say you should have faith. In, in some ways, I, I, I'm, not so I'm not so enthusiastic about faith because faith, when it comes to psychedelics, You don't need faith. You need courage. You know, you need enough courage to sit and drink the medicine or smoke the medicine or whatever it is you do. You need to trust yourself. You need to trust the medicine. And, and don't let anybody else tell you, you know, how to, I mean, learn for yourself. Think for yourself. One thing about psychedelics, they're, they're, they're intensely individual experiences. You know, yeah, your experience is not mine. Israel's experience is not mine. We all have our individual. So, so you have to have courage enough to take the plunge, you know, to, to, to do it, knowing that you're strong enough, you know, to, to experience it. And in most cases, when you get into it, you'll say, well, what was I worried about? You know, I mean, usually the experiences are not that scary. They can be, but they're usually not. Nothing that anybody can't take, you know, but, uh, but you know, people worry more about having a bad trip and all that. There isn't no such thing as a bad trip you know, in my estimation. I mean, unless you die, and maybe that's a bad trip. But who knows? I mean, you can't interview those people. Maybe they went out in a great place, you know. But but generally, you know, even the bad trips are, are uh, you can learn a lot from those things. So, so my main message is just have the courage to set aside your fears and your assumptions and just do it. You know, uh, I mean, educate yourself, know more or less what to expect, but then, but then put those aside and open yourself to whatever's going to happen. You know, like we say with ayahuasca, for example, you know, uh, people say, well, I, I need intentions and I, I want to have, you know, I cure my depression or, or whatever. Uh, you can have intentions about what you want to get from such an experience, but you also have to be willing to let those go if that's not what happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we often say ayahuasca will not necessarily give you what you want, Enjoy but it life. will always give you what you need, you know, I and think. and that's the thing with, with these things. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, so where can people find you online? When can they, where can they find me? Yes. You send an email to the Academy, Dennis at McKenna.academy. 
uh, or any other online sites where people can find you? Well, I have I have Facebook pages. I have you know a personal Facebook page, uh, the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss Facebook page. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Brotherhood of, of the Screaming Abyss is a, is a, uh, uh, well, anyway, that's on Facebook. Uh, McKenna Academy is on Facebook, but, uh, as well as the website. So okay. people can reach, keep, can reach me here. If, if they need to, they can reach me. Just Dennis at McKenna.academy. We'll add this uh, to the podcast show notes. Uh, and uh, finally, is there, uh, is there anything else you want or you, you want to add? No, I think we've covered it pretty well. <laughs> we've been at this for an hour and a half. Yes. And you've got another hour, so you should have plenty of material. Yeah, okay. we have like a really detailed and really profound and amazing interview. Dennis, thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom, and thank you for your, you know, for being so kind to us, receiving us, letting uh, ourselves to ask the questions, and responding with so much detail, so much care, and so much love. We really appreciate. Thank you, and. Thank you. Continuous. Thank you. It's been Thank a pleasure. You. Very, very good, very good talk. Uh, keep uh, it, keep it. Okay. Say hello there. <laughs> you see hey. it? Yeah. All right. All right. Let me know when it's posted. All right. Yes. Yes, I will send it to you by via via email, and I want to thanks also Alexander Tanus for making the intro and we will catch up in person in any retreat or symposium. Thank you for the work you do. It's so necessary. Okay. All right. Same to you. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year. Better year in 2020. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. So we had Dennis McKenna. This is the second interview. What do yeah. you think? Well, I'm very motivated to take further my explorations with psychedelics. I can't deny the, you know, just listening to him it makes your head wonder like, what if I take uh, five grams today? And you know, it just <laughs> get, you just get motivated to keep getting to know those compounds and any, I guess as a regular civilian that is taking, taking them for self-exploration you always have a little fear in the back of your head, like maybe am I doing too much? Maybe I shouldn't like lay off uh, a little bit or take, a, take more care of my integration work. But I feel like th having that fear in the back of your head, it also holds you back to do more inner self-exploration. So in, you're, with listening to Dennis, just realized like uh, I was having a little too much fear about the psychedelics, regardless that I'm taking them every four to six months. But I, we, we need to shorten that spam <laughs> of time. Luis is a really exper experienced psychonaut and also like a big, big player, great person, also a really uh, great experimenter and a beast, a beast. What's your takeaway? Well, uh, we need to do more work to get keep getting these compounds out there, people. Uh, the more information we produce and the more we get the word out there, the, most, the more people listen to stories of healing, of connecting with your purpose, connecting with God. Like we live in a time that a lot of people are in the desperate need of a ray of sunshine. Like uh, every people need to see that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I feel psychedelics are a great tool to show you that way for that light. So um, I guess we just need to have more conversations, creating more content, uh, being more open to tell the stories. Have a, when somebody asks, have the time to sit, sit down and properly explain the experiences that you had because the more honest and open we are about it, the, more, the sooner we're gonna achieve legalization, democratization of those compounds. And you know, the work is just starting. I could never say 
better and I could never find a better close for this podcast. Check out the work that the guys from Unlimited Science are doing. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the circle, uh, like a key circle of people that is spreading the word, as uh, Luis said uh, in a beautiful way. Uh, they're doing great work or is a collective psychedelic research for re-educating through the scientific and more research part and more like science-based, but also for the experiential. And also check out the, what the work that my people on uh, synthesis uh, retreats are doing, uh, synthesis uh, education, th synthesis programs, because they, they, they are on a similar quest. So thank you all. And remember, thank you, thank you Luis, for being Thank you, Isra. I'm very this. honored of being invited to this podcast. And if you don't disrupt yourself, someone will come and disrupt you. So, leave. Leave your chaos. <laughs> Amen.